Okay, uh, welcome back. <laughs> it's very, very long, fast three weeks. I think I flew so much I actually gained my own pair of wings. The people at security went, you again? <laughs> so many times I threw it. But Baruch Hashem. So it's, uh, it's in the past. <laughs> hey, uh, tonight is, um, oh, hey, one more week before, before Kabbalah Satara, Shvulus. And it's one of these things that we do year after, just like the Seder and everything else, year after year. And it always amazes me how everyone gets up and gives a sheer, and everyone's always trying to bring something new that was never brought up before. After 3,320 some odd years of uh, discussing this and yanim, it's like, you know, it's always Kedushin. You know, Torah is endless. Baruch Hashem, it's a wellspring of ideas that you can constantly draw from, if you're sensitive to it, you can pick up on, pick, pick up on things and, and you can, you know, look at things in a new light, and as society progresses also, you call it progression, it's not always progression, but as society moves, moves forward in history, that so we get, we gain insights and we see things in a different way than we didn't see in the past, because, just because our perspective has changed, our vantage point has changed, so, in a sense, uh, Shavuos, is a different Shavuos every year. It's a different idea, different different opportunity. It represents a different uh, Kabbalah Satara. You know, it's one term that applies to everybody at all times, but yet in every generation, Kabbalah Satara can mean a different thing. But there are certain fundamentals, certain things that are are, are just are just totally relevant to the idea that doesn't change. They're, they're timeless. They're just basically the essence of what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, you think by now we would know what those things are, but the truth is, it's a combination of forgetting them. It's a combination of never learning them in the first place. It's a combination of uh, you know people who give shirim and speak so fast you can't hear what they're saying anyhow. I was just listening to one of the shirim, the shirim I gave in New York this last uh, Monday actually, and I just can't believe how fast the words come out. I don't understand a word I'm saying. I don't know if the people were just, just being polite, but but uh, it's amazing how fast you think you are not speaking, only to find out how fast you are speaking. So. If that's the case, you can easily miss the point for 3,320 years if the same speaker keeps talking too fast. Uh, not the case, usually. But the basic idea of Kabbalah Sotar is like this. We have spoken about the union of, of Kisha HaBalei Just refresh your memories, that the whole point of the Omer is to develop a Leif Tov. Right? We spoke about that before, the idea of the first 32 days of the Omer is for developing the Lev, that's where the Gemach of, of 32 is Lev, that's the reason why Rabbi Kiva's students were taken for, to task at this specific time of year, as opposed to the rest of the time of year, as opposed to by Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, because obviously whatever sin is chidim, whatever lack of covet they were showing one to the other was not just something that occurred motzi, motzi yantif, and therefore we started acknowledging their deaths uh, for the next 32 days, they were obviously doing this day after day, year after year, and it happened to be that the Omer was a time that Kishbor who paid attention specifically to this idea because this is the Midah we're trying to develop. The whole point of Sirius Omer, the whole point of the Midas we count, for those who actually make a point to mention the Midas of Yom, is working on the Lev Tov. And uh, the 32 days correspond to the development of the, of the heart itself. And the last 17 days after Lagba Omer correspond to the, to the Tov aspect, developing the Tov aspect. And the threshold was Lagba Omer, right? And by now I shouldn't have to explain why that's the threshold, why right? after Lagba Omer, why the Zohar is the day of Rishim Barichai himself, the Rashbi himself, is the, the symbol of that threshold, right? It should be totally obvious by now, right? So I can just go, go weiter, go on. Mm, I've that? never heard that. Oh, okay. So okay. I'm, I'm excited to explain I don't that. know. I have been all this year. Uh, the, uh, the basic idea, the concept is that, that everything goes wrong as a function of superficiality. Oversimplification. Oversimplification. Of what? I, I have jet lag still, so. Yeah, okay. The, the, the sparks aren't exactly, you know, like the spark plug, they're not quite going where they're supposed to go, you know. But uh, oversimplification, that we take things for granted, we look at the world itself in general, the aspects of life, and that's not where it's at. Life, because Baruch Hu made the world in such a way that there's a surface level, that's shot level, and a person's responsible on their own, and with the help of a good Rebbe, and the Gemara, and everything else, to go deeper. You have to go from Shat to Remus to Drush to the Haggadah, starts us off in that process. It's not a simple thing. That's why every single year you see one of the Sforim that probably has generated more Sforim 
Then other the other safer besides the Mishnah Torah itself, perhaps what would be more would be more too, but as a safer is the Haggadah, it's a single work, the amount of commentary you find. In fact, it was I'm just working this this year on Haggadah. Uh, came up, you know, hopefully, will be a, a little unique approach to, to the to the uh, Haggad that I was when I was staying in New York at my brother-in-law's house, and he was always far. In fact, in the room that I was I was staying in, I, I see there's a, a new Haggad over there, another, another Haggad over here, and one over here. The whole, you know, amongst all the Sfor that he has there, there's all these new art school Haggadas that have come out and, and uh, different perushi and different vantage points. Because basically, that, that's, that, that's what the Haggad is all about. The point of the Haggadah is to refresh our memory that you have to, you have to mind, you have to go deeper, you have to dig deeper, and that's where you find the Kodesh Baruch Hu. That's where the Mishkan is mentioned basically four times in the Chumash, because the first time you go through it, it's just like, oh, just, you know, these are the parts, and here's how you build it, and here are the people responsible for building it, and the, the, it repeats itself, repeats itself, and usually what happens, for example, if you're talking to somebody, and you say something to them, and they acknowledge it on a level you think is very superficial, you know, so rather than say, that's not what I meant, somebody should simply repeat yourself again. In fact, there's a story like this where Rev, Rev Yankov Weinberg told to us, he was one, when he was a Talmud at Heim Berlin, and Rav Huttner, so I was giving the shear, so as a bocher, you know, he, he, he was new to the shear, and he was a very bright man, even when he was very young. And he asked a question, and Rav Huttner just basically went, he listened to the question, and then he went on. Didn't even address it. So he waited a few minutes more, and he thought maybe the Rav didn't understand his question. And so what he did instead was he asked the question again a second time. Rav Hutner looked at him, right, you know, acknowledging the question was asked, and then he just went right on, right? And he realized by that time that what he was basically telling him was the question was being answered in what was being said. If he paid attention to what I just you know, told you, then you would hear the answer that you're looking for. The reason you're asking this question is because you're not really paying attention on a deep enough level to, uh, to, to, you know, to hear the answer. Sometimes you're talking to a person... And rather than, than give them the answer directly, you know, it may be a, a little of a mind game, but you'll you repeat yourself another time, and the person will say, yeah, I heard that. And they go on, so you, you repeat yourself with, with the exact same words a third time, and eventually the person realizes that whatever he thought he understood or heard, he heard di- or didn't hear exactly on the level that you meant it. So likewise, when Torah re- re- rephrases or repeats the, 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 the guidelines and the instructions for building the Mishkan, it's because the, the Torah is telling you that whatever you thought you understood the first time about this, you probably didn't. There's a deeper level. So repeat it another time. Just in case you thought you still understood it. We're talking, just think, think about it for a second. We're talking about a microcosm of Maise Bereshis. All the instructions that the Kodesh Baruch Hu used, or not all of them, but a tremendous amount of ideas and construction and, and, and information that went into the, into the ability of Maise Bereshis is somehow encoded in the various different parts of the building of the Mishkan. The Mishkan itself and all the different uh, vessels that were created and all the different, you know, the actual format, the structure, which is why Moshe Rabbeinu said, I can't put this together. If 600,000 men could not put together the Mishkan, then how can I possibly, possibly do it myself? So the question you have to ask is, why would 600,000 men not be able to put together a structure that really wasn't that big at all? I mean, today we put together much bigger structures with, with far less people. So why were they unable to do it? Because it wasn't simply a question of physically attaching the pieces and put it together according to some kind of master plan, it, you know, put slot A into, in, or, or tab A to slot B, it, was, it wasn't a question of that. There was tremendous Kabbalah behind this, and if you make one mistake when it comes to Kabbalah, you can, you can mess up the entire thing and destroy worlds. And that's what Moshe was saying. If 600,000 people were not Zoycha, to be able to understand how to assemble this thing you know, properly, how could one person, even though I'm Moshe Rabbein, how could one person understand how to build the Mishkan properly? So Kosh Baruch says, you're right, nobody can and nobody would. I'll do it. Only I can do it. And, and anyhow, I'm the one always doing it. We don't even know how many things we do in our lives that if you know, left up to our own, our own you know, devices, we would destroy. And the Kosh Baruch Hu makes it somehow work out that we're successful. Because uh, just, you know, you know, in fact, I just, you know, just the other day, I did give a shir, a shir on Monday morning, and I decided to take the New York Transit from where I was in Queens all the way over to Brooklyn. You know, and I thought, well, you know, Look at this, the, the map. All these like things are all connected. You know, so, so I figured it'd take me an hour and a half. It was a, it was a holiday morning. I thought it would actually be a little faster. It was actually slower as a result of that. But uh, from the map alone, because you can look up on Google Maps and you can see your whole path and it tells you how to go, where to go, and all that. And I thought to save some money and for the challenge of a night at time. And also it was the Aliyah of of the Sota and the Nazir and Birchas Kohanim, which is a long Aliyah. So you know, I always have patience with it, but being on the subject for so long. 
for me, that's a good place to do it. That was my day to do that. And uh, in the end, there must have been four or five places I had to change subways and, and get to this to get to that. And in retrospect, I didn't make one mistake the entire way, but that was remarkable because I had no idea where I was going half the time. And even I asked people, you know, oh, you know, it's like this over there, you know, I almost got the wrong train, train twice. At the last second, just stepped off it. Because the way it's, like, it's set up is not so clear cut all the time. Although, although the truth is, if you know where you're going, it turns out that New Yorkers also have problems with the, with the system. It's not so logical necessarily all the time. But I was just thinking, like, and I got there literally 10 minutes before this year. It took me two hours to get from where I came from, and it was hot. It's nice out here right now. It was so hot and humid. In New York, the moment you walk out the front door, you broke out into a sweat. So you're stocking the, the subways themselves are air conditioned. That was fine, but the subway stations and walking outside was very, very hot and very muggy, very, you know, very, very humid. And you know, I got there literally ten, ten minutes before the shear, and it was just such a, such a nice because at any point in time I could easily have made a mistake and added another half an hour to my trip and been late for sure. And after planning this thing for like months or at least mm-hmm. many weeks, and then being there for three weeks to miss it the last time before I'm leaving. It was, it was Mama Shi, Kush Bofu, just like, you know, bring you from place to place. To, I, I did everything right, but not by, by Kavana. Right? Kush Bofu just made it work out somehow. And I remember getting up to the last stop. I couldn't believe I actually got to the last stop without making a mistake. That's all through life. That's all through life. Kush Bofu is doing that, to, you know, doing that for us and doing it to us. And, and we tend to think that, that we're the ones who are successful. Even professionals can choke. Even professionals can make mistakes at times. And the Kosh Baruch Hu makes us successful in whatever we're doing. That's what the Kosh Baruch Hu told Moshe Benu, And that's what the Mishkan was all about. The Mishkan was much, much deeper and significant and, and profound mm-hmm. a project than we tend to give it credit for being by reading the Chumash. It's much deeper. Superficiality is what destroys everything. The whole society's come down. God <coughs> is in the details. And in the detail of the details in the end. And that's why everything about the Yiddish Kaitav, a Talmudic approach to life, the Talmud itself is an approach to life. It's not just a, a process, because if you think about it, if you think about it for a second, right, it's pretty bizarre. You take it to the average textbook in a Western you know, university, a college, or even a public school, and you open it up, everything is written to be as clear as possible. We're teaching you medicine. We're teaching you law. We're teaching you how to be a, a citizen of society. The last thing we want to do is play mind games. If it comes to a test to see what kind of person should be accepted, mm-hmm. if it comes to you know, a job uh, resume to see who's really you know, you know, ruined for the job, so maybe there might be some mm-hmm. trick questions to see how alert you are. But when it comes to going to school and actually learning what to do, you want to be as clear as possible. There's no place in the world that it should be truer than the Gemara. The Gemara should be an open, closed book. You open the Sefer, you read from the very first Mishnah. There's no discussions about what's missing from the Mishnah and why it's so, why it was so terse. Okay, so it's a memory device, but this is Torah Shabbat Peh. This should be as clear as possible. So we, we, we're not only teaching you how to learn, right? We're, teaching, we're not even teaching, you're not even only learning, you have to learn how to learn first. There's a, there's a preliminary step. Before you can learn Gemara, you have to first learn the, you know, the tools and the devices and the approaches so that you can finally enter the Gemara. And even then, the, top, the amount of machlokas and, and discussion and svarim upon svarim. Now, why? Why? Why make it so difficult for a person to be clear? Even you, know, you open the Mishnah Brewer, which is, you know, sometimes it's a little bit oxymoron because he breaks down all the machlokas in the United States aside, and he passes in the end. And you decide you don't like, but it's not really so clear cut. You know, it's incredible for a religion that's based upon your Shemai and fear of God and getting it exactly right. It's amazing how easy it is to make a mistake and get it wrong in the end. Because an underlying theme to all of this, to all of Yiddishkeit, is that the true your Shemai is going to be somebody who's not intellectually lazy. Somebody who's prepared to go the distance to ask the question, and then ask the question, the question, and a question, the question, the question, the question, you know, until you get to the point. Like we spoke about by the Haggadah, right? By the Haggadah, the question that's being asked is not really, you know, why do we eat matzah on the 15th of Nisan? Because we know why we eat matzah, but it was not, not a friend to bake bread. That's a very popular, that's the reason why we don't eat, you know, hummus, and we eat matzah instead. Why is it, don't eat matzah? Whatever, right? Why don't we eat hummus? Why do we eat matzah instead, right? So that's not the question we're asking. In the Haggadah. That's not the question. That's a preliminary question. The question is, why was there not enough time to bake bread? 
Because we know how little time it takes to make to, to make chumitz. It just takes eight minutes of unworked water and flour. That's it. That's all it takes. The, the, the difficulty is never making the matzah, I mean, making, making the bread. The difficulty is in making the matzah because it's so easy to become a chumitz. The kosher Pesach matzah is a big, it's a big guess. It takes a lot of work, a lot of concentration, and a lot of energy to do it. So it's clearly the exact opposite. If they're rushing to leave Mitzrayim, there was no big deal. Just let you know, you know, put the flour water together, go pack a suitcase, and, be, and believe me, by the time you come back, 18 minutes will have passed. And you'll have, you'll have full 100% chomets in the end. So the question is not why there wasn't enough time to bake bread, because there was enough time to bake bread. The question is why was it they were made to have no time to bake bread? Why was that in, in, in position put, up, put upon us? <laughs> Why were we put in a situation where we would have no time to bake bread and we should have had time to bake bread? Oh, so now we're getting closer to the answer. But we're still not there yet. Right? The answer is because the Jewish people had to leave Israel very quickly. Because why? Because they're holy and Tuma? No. So they're not holy and Tuma. So then why did they have to leave quickly that they couldn't make chametz that we have to eat matzah? Mm-hmm. He's he adding the question to the question. The finally, to the answer, that ultimate answer we always, we always come to, because had we not left when we did, then evil would have been destroyed, the khir would have been destroyed, and therefore the purpose of creation would not have been served. There's still one more question. That's what's, the pro- what's the problem with that? That's good. That's the good thing. Yeah. So why would that be? So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the question that God is asking. Did you bring that one up to your city this year? That's the question, that's the only question that God is asking. Every other question is just to get to this question. Why are we not allowed to destroy evil in Mitzrayim, Leil Seder? That's the question. That's the eternal, historical question that goes through all of time until this very day, because we are sitting here today, even though Baruch Hashem Zoyche, to be near Israel, we're still part of the Galus. And that's, that's the Haggadah is asking. It's just it, it, next year. If you're zeichet to make another seder, but Shiach's not here yet, and for some reason now we, we still have to make another seder, just start the seder by asking this one question. This is how every seder should begin. This is it. Why are we still in exile? That's the question the Haggad is asking you. That's what the Matz is saying when it's looking at you. Why are you still in exile? What are you doing here still? Not like, well, let's commemorate there was once a gula. There wasn't a gula. It was Mekimat no Gula Fourth is died in Makas Chosheh. That's a gula. You lost, tw- you lost you know, 12 million people and 3 million people went out. Oh, well, at least there was 3 million. Well, don't know, but they died in the desert. Right? They, le- they left. How many people actually made it to Israel who left Mitzrayim? A two or a couple. The Gemara says two. Caleb and uh, yeah. Yeshua. The, yeah. Moshe didn't make it. Aaron didn't make it. Okay, the women made it. We're talking about the, of the, it turns out from the, of the 600,000 men between the age of 20 and 60, how many actually left Mitzrayim and military to Israel? Two. Two. 599,998 people did not make it of the 600,000 that left Mitzrayim. That's, that's called a doula. That's, that's not redemption. So the Matz is yelling at us and saying, what are you talking about? The fact that you're still sitting here doing this like you've been doing it for thousands of years, something is wrong. I'm here to remind you it has to be done. That's the beginning process. Right? So you have to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's why it all revolves with the questions of the... Of the and that's really ultimately what the Russia's problem is. The Russia is just totally superficial. He's just, I'm not interested in the deeper shot. Just what's this thing mean on an everyday simple level that I should be doing it right now? The Chachem, chachem as I said, you give chachem, the Chachem to Chachem, it becomes even wiser in the end. Because that's what Claudius was all about. We're always joking, you know, we always answer questions with a question. Because we know there's always a deeper answer. And at the end of that, that, that search and that struggle, that's where you find the Kodesh Baruch So we take that and we apply it here. In fact, another, another aspect of the, of the Seder, of the Haggadah, which is a very, very important question, the game that we, over, we overlook it, and it's not even translated properly, usually in most Haggadahs, and as Manish Nahalayla is a Mikol Halilos. Right? How do you translate that, that sentence? Manish Nahalayla is a. How do you translate those words? What difference is this? This night different from all other nights. But that's how we translate it. Yeah. How does the Hebrew actually read? Why? What does Nishtana mean? What changed? Manish means what changed this night? What changed? 
Something changed. That's what Manish Nuran Halai is. What this night, what changed this night that makes this night different from all other nights? That's what's being asked over here. That's the question. We never actually explain it and translate it properly. Because, what's that supposed to mean? You know, sometimes when you, you read a question, or you read something from the Gemara, it doesn't exactly make sense the way it's read. Right? For example, Noach Matzechei B'nei Hashem. Noach found Chain in the eyes of God. But that doesn't make sense, because first of all, God doesn't have eyes. And even if God did have eyes, he's very tall. How could Noah find the chain in his eyes in the first place? Where is he going to go? Which mountain is he going to climb? Right? So that doesn't make sense. So therefore, it must be the fall. It's, 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 a, it's a euphemism. Right? It's, a, it's a metaphor. It's not really the real thing. Until it turns out, the Kabbalah explains, well, there is a concept of eyes in this respect, and Noah can do the look, which is why Noah and Chain are reverse images, because if you look into a mirror, you see the reverse image, and it's all it's letters, whatever, but, but there's a concept here that's being brought out. So the first approach we take, we approach them superficially, is that if it doesn't make sense on a superficial level, it can't really be what we're talking about, so therefore, we have to change all the shot. So managed to know what changed this night, you know, it doesn't really make sense to us. Because how would you apply that every year? You know, maybe back in the shrine, but, but what, how does it apply to me today? And we ask all these questions, we're still doing this. But that's what the Chagat is really saying. God is saying, because in here is where, and believe me, this is not a, a Shiba Pesach, we're past that, this is all the, the Shvuas, because if you understand, the Shvuas is just, it's just, the Yom Tosh, it's, it's just the Shisha Pesach. Chazal explained that the, the Pesach itself acts like the first day of Yom Tov. Shuz is like the last day of Yom and Sirius Omer is like Chol Amoed. That's why they're connected. So you cannot possibly understand the end if you don't understand the beginning. And we can discuss it in various different ways, but this is one very important approach. And this is a, 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 a fundamental of, of Hashkafa, because it comes down to two approaches to a holiday, and therefore two approaches to Gabal Torah. And the reason why we're still in God is to this very day. Because, believe it or not, as smart as we are, as firm as we are, as well-learned we are, we still approach the Haggadah and the Seder the same way the rest of the Jewish world does. Even people who are far less learned, far less experienced, and don't even believe we believe in terms of, in ter- in terms of Torah Sinai. Because we treat Pesach and we treat the Seder. Imagine if you were to walk through like one of these science fiction movies, like this big, huge, round circle, like that's kind of time machine, right? It's just a flat thing. On the other side, you can't see anything, right? But as you walk through it, you walk into a separate world. You just find yourself in another universe altogether. Clearly a different place. Would you say, oh, that was interesting. Well, look at that, another world. Okay, well, what were, we doing? what were we just talking about? Right? Well, how would you respond to a situation like that? It would be, it would be mind-blowing. You totally be shocked, and, and your whole world would change in a moment, and you'd spend the rest of the time trying to understand what just happened to you, and why it happened to you, and what, and what does it mean to your life at this point on? Can we get back? What's this world like? Why is there time, you know, a, a, a time portal in the first place? That's how the, sh- the Seder should be to, to, every, every, to every Jew. That's how the Pesach, the, the Haggadah, and the, the night of, of the first night of Pesach, that's how it should be for every Jew. You're walking through a portal. That's the question. What does it mean? It means that what changed this night, 3,000 years ago, and for that minute, maybe going back to, to my separation. Not maybe, but it does. It goes back to my separation. What did the Kodesh Baruch Hu change in the Seder Hayyot, in the Seder of the universe, in the Seder of my separation? What did he change that gives this night a whole different quality that's like walking through a, you know, a time warp, a portal, into a whole other dimension? And for the night, that's where we're going to spend the rest of our, you know, for, uh, for the rest of the night, that's where we're going to be. What changed? That's the question. Like, we're doing all these things. Why does it make a difference to dip the carcass in salt water? Is it simply commemorative? Is it only to remember what once happened? Or is there something happening in the universe because I'm doing this? You know, for example, if a person saw how many angels were lined up to get their tefillahs every day, if all of a sudden the Shemayim would open up, like by Chris Yamsub and the Shifcha, by Chris Yamsub saw more of the... the what did they see? What did they see? He said, more of what? More black space, right? Shem opened up the Shemaim. So they saw different floors, different levels. You know, what did they see? They saw all the angels and how they operate between the Kush Baruch and us and how the whole universe is it's massive. And they're totally in awe, which is what inspired them to sing sure in the first place. We're just sitting here cut off from the rest of the spiritual reality because we, just don't, we don't see ourselves connected to any real spiritual reality. But if you could see how many Malachim are sent down to get your tefillahs and the, the, the process of taking your field to Shemaim, your Dabni would be a different experience. 
It's like people have no idea. When we go through dubbing so fast and we compromise clarity and, and uh, kavana for speed because we have to make it 15 minutes long as opposed to 17 minutes long or 18 minutes long, it's amazing how much a difference three minutes, three minutes makes to Shemona Esri. You know, when you're on an airplane, you have no choice. You have to turn as soon as possible because turbulence could happen any second. The third is start you know, pushing you back to your seat, basically. It's one thing. But when you're a big Knesset and no one really has to go anywhere for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, if we, we just don't understand. It's a mechanical process. So the Haggadah says, that's not what life is about. That's not the way it really works. The Haggadah is saying, what changed? What's going, on, what's going on tonight? Specifically, that makes all of this relevant. And therefore, I should understand how to use it to change my reality and the reality of the world. That's the question being asked. by Manishtana. What changed? Because this is, a, this is an ongoing process. This is not merely a commemoration of an event. We're not sitting down simply to, 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 to mark a day in the, of the, in the past and remember what once was, like for example, Independence Day you know, in the States or even Yom Hatzmuth for that matter. There's something, some special energy in the world that comes down because this day in fact is different that gives me a capacity to accomplish things there's no way I can accomplish the rest of the year. And therefore the exact same thing is, is true of Shuas. There's definitely a Kabbalah of Torah taking place. What's even more remarkable, people don't think about it, is that it's not even the time of Kabbalah Satora that we have right now. The Kabbalah Satora that we have right now was after Yom Kippur, when Moshe went up the third set of 40 days and actually asked for forgiveness because of the golden calf, finally got it and came back with what we call Torah's Bria, which is the Torah we have right now. All the dinim of and halachas we have right now. So the actual Simchus Torah is really the real Kabbalah Satora on our level. The Torah that Moshe brought down on Shuas, he broke. Right, he went up, and, and he didn't even bring it down at this point in time. He basically just went up on Shavuos night, and he was there for 40 days, and came down, saw the golden cap, and broke the luchas. We never got the luchas he went up to get on Shavuos night. It doesn't make a difference. The fact he went up on that, on that when he went up the next day, the fact that Shavuos and Kishboko spoke, the Kala Yisrael, and, and we had that energy in the world, even though we lost it, but we had it, the door, the door opens up year after year, there's still the possibility of Kabbalah Satara, if the person's real with it, on a, on a level that matches the original one, because something changed that night in the universe. It was the first Kabbalah Sator. It goes back to pre Mysibrations. The energy of Shus goes back to, to the original lights that the Kodesh Baruch used to make Mysibrations. It's all rooted in there. But that's when they broke through. It's like a plant, for example, that develops below the surface. You put the seed in the ground, what, three, four inches below the ground, and you can't see anything for the, for the, for the first little while. But it's happening below the ground, right? The seeds start to you know, the, the decay, the roots start to come out, it starts getting nourishment, it's growing, and then one day, just one day, one fantastic, glorious day, you look and you go back there. Remember as a little kid, when you're waiting and you're waiting and waiting to see nothing, and then one day, you look, and there's a little green thing sticking out of the ground, it broke through. And from that point, it starts growing, starts, you know, starts growing, until the gardener cuts it down. But it just, you know, and it just becomes a, you know, a, a metzius that wasn't there. It, it broke the surface. So likewise, Kabbalah Satar was there the entire time. But it never broke the surface. On Shavuos night, that, you can't take it away. Whatever we lost by the golden calf, you cannot undo. The same, for example, a person could do a mitzvah and then do ten averas after that. The avera will not cancel out the mitzvah. The only thing that can cancel a mitzvah is charakta. If a person regrets mm-hmm. the mitzvah, right. yeah. then retroactively... You can, and I, I'm not even so sure 100% you can even do that if it's a real full cancellation. Because people change, their minds change, and not, not the same person. To actually cancel the mitzvah would mean to go back to where you were holy at that time, and, and ke'ilu, the same way, for example, tshuva requires to be in the same situation, and not to be a very again. So I imagine the charata has to be that you're in the same frame of mind, and you still have charata. But it's unlikely, but, but mostly, you certainly can undo the mitzvah to some degree. But other than that, the avera is not going to cancel the mitzvah. The averas are the averas. They need kippur, but the mitzvah is the mitzvah. Likewise, when, the, when the, it opened up, something happened that night, and it didn't just happen that night. By the way, it happened just like erev Shabbos. You have you know toast for Shabbos, and you have the ability to start chopping the kedusha of Shabbos in advance of Shabbos. Likewise, the kedusha of Shavuos and Kabbalah Satora began at least from Rosh Chodesh which is why we don't say Tachanun from Rosh Chodesh even onward. But even before that, going back even through the Omer period itself, it starts to build up, starts to build up. Just like between, it's like Shovavim, like Shmos, and Purim, or Tubishvat and Purim, and Pesach, it's a build-up. Everything is always a build-up. 
So we, we spoke about how, you know, Lev Tov, that's what the whole thing is about. But what, what is the essence of Lev Tov? So the pre speaks about this in, in quite a bit of detail in, on Chumash. A few places he brings it up. But the basic idea comes down to one really simple concept, just very difficult to em- employ. Kabbalah Satora is about emptying your heart of everything else that doesn't matter. It's not about staying up all night and learning and learning more halacha because you know something? We've been doing that for thousands of years and we're still in exile. And people do it all night, they fall asleep during Dublin the next day a lot of times. And their lives are not dramatically changed. And their level of commitment to Torah is not dramatically changed. It's a thing we do. It's a nice minhag, you know, we celebrate it. I think, I think for a lot, you know, a major part of the Shavuos experience, a major part, is the fact that people have milks as a suda and have cheesecake. No, that, that's what it has become. Hmm? So, I'm being facetious. No, I'm being, it, it, it's a novel thing. For, you, 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 hmm? And day. some men sleeping all day too, right? It's a, a novel thing for people to be able to have, you know, have uh, either milk or scholars. Halakhically, we don't do things like that normally. <coughs> There's a change. There's a change in the People make a big deal with the cheesecake and the soup, the meal, they have a whole thing up, you know, up, you know, place itself out. And then we stay up all night too. It's a big thing as well in some places. But the main point of Shavuos is not even any of that. Yeah. Well, what, why is cheesecake so important? I, I, mean, I, know, I know the minfa, but why is that so important? Why, why is it, well, it becomes, a, no, only because of the fact that we don't do things like that. It's a change. Just like when the Seder, for example, take the, the car off the table to attract, to attract, you know, attract attention. The fact is, a, is a, it's kept. It's an, it's an experiential thing. Take away that part of it, should become an everyday, like a normal holiday. The fact that we make this change and we, make, we emphasize, it's man gvisenu. Right? We have man tor senu, we have man cheru senu, it's man simcha senu, it's man gvinu senu. Right? Because, because that's really what... <clears throat> it becomes it becomes literally almost the focus for a lot of people. But the whole point, the whole point of Shavuos is the end of a process that either you're there by the time you get there, or it's not going to happen, and you're going through the motions. Lev Tov, as Ramban points out on the mitzvah, v'yahachta l'rech kamocha, the Gemara says, it brings down a very famous Misa. Who would have ever thought to use this Gemara as an explanation for Shavuos? But the Gemara says, Two people in a desert, one canteen of water, enough water for one person to survive. Share it, they both die. <coughs> What's the halacha? What's the halacha? Sure. That's what you would think. Why would you think the halacha is to share? No, don't what? Share. Oh, don't share, don't share. Don't share. That's what you think? Yeah. I would have thought the halacha is to share it. I, my first, right. before, before, before you share it, then both die. Yeah, yeah. but, but Rabbi Kiva says, Love your neighbors yourself. It's a derisive mitzvah. It's a cloud by the Torah. One second, before I get to that, right? In fact, what I would assume for the halach is, and this is what the other, and by the way, this is the other Manda Manda Gemara. The other Manda Manda Gemara, but he's, he, sa- he says, he brings the, the, the mitzvah of the Ahafta of Kamocha. And says that in spite of the fact that there's not enough water for both people to survive, just like you want to drink the water and survive, so does your friend want to drink the water and survive. And therefore, rather than one person survive and, and drink and survive, both people should, should, should share it. And neither one should see the other die. They should die together in the end. That's the other opinion. Interesting enough, that Rabbi Akiva, who always says, Zeklal Gadabatara, Vehafalur Kamocha, he comes along and says, Not here though. Not here. Because the Torah says, V'chai behem. And V'chai behem means that for the most part, you do mitzvahs up until the point they're going to kill you. Right? There are obviously the parameters. But in this case, since doing the mitzvah of love your neighbor as yourself would result in killing you, because you're sure, because there's one very important detail over here. This is because the canteen belongs to one person. If it didn't belong to anybody, you'd have to share it was simply half good. They found it together. You have to share. Why should you survive? Your friend shouldn't survive the end. Right? And he can't give it up to you because he's committing suicide. So you have to share it until you run out of, out of water. And that's the halacha. Right? But since the canteen belongs to somebody already, it's his shkacha. His shkacha that he has the water. There's only enough for him. The other guy, whatever reason, he ran out. And as a result of that, the halacha, as Rebbe Kiva says, in this, in this instance, the mitzvah of loving neighbors yourself would not apply 
and therefore the person to whom the canteen belongs, he drinks it, and then the person dies, and that's the way, that's the halacha. It's the principle that you shall live by them, and if overrides. you share, then you're done. Yeah, it overrides, it overrides. If the Torah didn't include that, by the way, if the Torah did not say, b'chai behem, you'd be mechuyim with the rights to share the water until you both die. The yeah, that's <laughs> No man. Okay. You want to? <laughs> the um, the law says that you should live tied to the ownership uh, of, the, of the canteen. Right? Because the, it already belongs to you, so it, since it belongs to you, you have a right to even schus that the, the other person doesn't have. It's your property. It's your property. Mm-hmm. And therefore, you know, by giving it away, you, it'd be a situation of the mitzvah of loving neighbors yourself, because that would apply to you as the owner. Because since because you're in a position to give it. Because it belongs to you. If it was Hefker, it's not really a mystical love to make himself anymore because it belongs to everybody. It's not really uh... So this prompts the Ramban to ask what the mitzvah actually means. To love your neighbors yourself. What does it mean to love your neighbor? You know, if it, you know, normally, if I'm having a piece of bread and I'm not going to starve to death by not having it, my neighbor wants it too, so I have to share the bread. You know, either give it away completely or share it because that's what the mitzvah would imply. But in this case, I don't. So he says, therefore, what does the mitzvah actually mean? So he explains the mitzvah means, therefore, what should really transpire in the situation. Basically, these two Jews, they don't have a shulchan to look at, but hopefully they know the halakha. They should sit down and say, you know, if I could, if I could, I'd sh- at least share the water with you, if not give it completely to you. Because how can I watch you die? You're a fellow human being, and you're going to suffer. I can't, I can't go through that. And the other person should say, my brother, thank you so much for your concern, I really appreciate that, but you know what the halacha states the following, I can't take the water anyhow, even if you offered it. It'd be wrong for me to take the water, because the halacha says you have to drink the water and survive, and I can't take that, so what, what would I gain in the end by doing it? These two people are on the verge of death, they want canteen, that's what's supposed to happen. That's the most bizarre reality possible. I mean, people normally, in a situation like that, they don't go that route. Normally what happens is they forget all their Eretz and humanity, they, they become them. desperate, they fight each other, it doesn't make a difference anymore. Who owns what? People re- even resort to cannibalism in situations like that. And for Yachman Islam, it's a terrible, terrible situation. No one should ever be tested in that thing, but that's what's going to happen. So Torah comes along and says, but that's exactly the whole point. It's exactly what the mitzvah of love your neighbors yourself is, as we said before many times. that The Torah is really telling you is you have to be objective. You have to be an objective individual. Objectivity is everything in this world. It's everything. Because you cannot be at some Lokim if you're subjective. Subjective, when you hear the word subjective, what do you think about? Yourself. Yeah, primal desires. You think about, you know, mm-hmm. looking out for number one, you know, for the, the, the instinct for survival, the survival of the fittest. All these things come down to me. The world revolves around me. It's a much more animalistic approach to life. It's a very human approach because we have that element of ourselves you know, that's part of who we are. But the Torah is telling you, even the most dire circumstances you want, I really see it, Salomon Lakim, as the Medrash says, that when, when Shul and Melech went out to battle, this last battle, even though Shmuel told them, tomorrow you're going to die. You and your sons, you're going to go to battle on behalf of Klai Yisrael, and you're going to die. All of you. All four of you, I think it was three sons and, 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 and Shul himself. And instead he went out to battle and he fought as if he could win. And the Medrash says, Akash Borhu called all the Malachim together and said, You asked me why I made Maisa Bereshis? You question why I made man? Come take a look. This is it right here. This man knows he's going to die, and with his sons, in this battle. And look at the way he's fighting. Totally above himself. Totally outside of his own personal... Other, other fathers might have tried to save their sons and run away from battle and you know, you know, give up the monarchy. But he's going to... He's, he's dying a hero. That's the most noble thing a person can do in the most dire of circumstances on this trip, you know, there's quite a few times where I, I saw, not to such a degree as this, but I saw people make sacrifices for other people and put themselves out at airports and just like a certain, you know, humanity, not everybody had, other people were not like that. It was very rare, very few people. People started, you know, you know, you get set in line for security and things like that. And everybody's got to get through and everybody has to get to the store and any other rest and do whatever they're doing. But there's a few people in the world I don't know how many, but in the worst of circumstances, they can maintain their humanity. They're some lukus at all times. When it gets so tense in such a situation, your life's on the line, and still what matters most to you is to live up to a standard of Kosh who is set for mankind, 
That's the ultimate. But you can't do that if you're not objective. Because even if you want to, even if it crosses your mind to be like that, if you're a subjective individual person on an ongoing basis every day, it's very hard to be objective. You just can't pop into objectivity. Sometimes a person is confronted with death. Sometimes a situation where the hopelessness and the helplessness is so obvious and the person can't do anything about it. There's no way to change it. They might have a last moment of nobility because that's all that's left. They'd rather leave the world with some kind of dignity. But for the most part, as long as people feel there's a chance to survive some way, somehow, they will stoop to very low standards very often just to survive, just to be able to succeed. I mean, the business world is just built upon this meter. I mean, the stories you hear, the books that you read, the movies that were made, is this, you'll, you'll find nice people. Just like, for example, in politics. In politics, you're not going to find real politicians. The real politicians are the ones who realize it's not worth being a politician. Because whatever they want to do for the sake of improving mankind, not going to happen. It's not the way the world works today. So therefore, they stay out of it. And the other people who know how to abuse the system will jump right into it a lot of times and take advantage of it. Not everybody, but enough people. To the point the system becomes pretty corrupt. And the world becomes pretty corrupt as a result of that. There's no Kabbalah Satora on that level. There's no Kabbalah Satora of Hashem on that level. There's Kabbalah Satora. Everybody is Makabal Torah in some level. If you're living by Torah misses, you're Makabal Torah. But how much are we doing it to the Kashborhu intended to be? Because if he were, probably the Gula would be here right now. So when we ask the, we ask the question, we're not simply asking the question on Leil Seder. We're asking about every Chag, the Torah was Koveya for a Jew to keep. About Sukkot, just by Pesach we do because that's the national holiday. That's the, that's the refresher course. Once a year on Leil Seder, that's when the whole Israel goes through like a refresher, refresher course. Just like, for example, a driver's education. Every once in a while you get pulled in and go through a refresher course. It's not the main course, but that's where you get the rules all over again. Because Baruch refreshes our memory on Leil Seder, how to approach life and how to approach history. So it comes Shulis, we come after a whole period of Sphere of Umber. Do you, do you feel transformed? I mean, besides the hair that you got after Lug Umber. Do you feel transformed? Do you feel that your life has changed dramatically since, since Leil Seder? This was, was Pesach for you a major turning point? A major transition that you could act with? always a wow, I can't believe I was able to accomplish so much Leil Seder. I mean, for the most part, I'm just trying to stay up. You know, I'm just trying to like, take advantage of the situation without you know, falling asleep before the whole thing is over. I mean, I can get into it, but you know, there's something missing, some kind of energy we're not tapping into. And likewise, by Shavuos, you know, there's some, it's an energy there. We can sense it, we know it's there, but to be transformed. Are we not able to transform ourselves? It depends how you approach the evening. If it's simply, well, tonight we stay up all night, why? And, and even the reason, by the way, that's given. Why, what's the reason that's given? When we stay up all night, because the next morning, Kalah Yisrael overslept. You buy that? Come on. You don't want to buy that? You're, by the, you're the foot of Har Sinai. God has spoken. You do Karbanis for the first time. Tukash Borchum. The procedure that's taking place every single day is mind boggling. It's mind-blowing. The whole ex- Could you even go to sleep that night if you knew the next day you would fly at 6 o'clock in the morning? How well do you sleep the night before? How well do you sleep? Yeah, it's like you're ans- you know, anxious the whole time. I might miss the flight. I might miss the taxi. How many... A whole nation over... Nobody got up on time. Not even Moshe Rabbeinu to stand and blow the shelter and go, Ooh, look, it's time, right? There was not one alarm clock amongst the entire nation, that nobody was able to get up that next morning on time and wake everybody up. Okay, it's three million people, so start half an hour early. Start an hour early. There wasn't any reasons whatsoever, all these people. No? What's the source for saying they overslept? Measure says it. Measure says it. That's what measure says. They Russia overslept. Be, I, I, I heard before that they, uh, the problem was that they, uh, that they slept before, and I think uh, that they shouldn't have slept. No, uh, they, no, it's because they slept in. They, they, they slept past the time. They were, they, that's why we don't, we don't go to bed, because of the fact to make sure we won't miss the next morning. <laughs> right? That's what it says. The, 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 I mean, it defeats the purpose. So what, what's the piece of... I mean, I know myself. If I stay up all night, I invite Shachar 
Who, who's, who, who's focusing on Davening? That's because that's, that's because Davening for us is boring. But if you were by Har Sinai, I can tell you that the next morning you have no problem staying out. It'd be a different experience. It's a whole different thing. They're learning different. And then what, what do you do right after Shabbos? You make kiddush and you go to sleep. Right. You that's okay. Up. That's fine. That's no problem. Right. You're taking a nap for three, four hours. I thought it's no problem. Except the entire night. The problem is sleeping the rest of the day and not having kavanah the rest of the day. You're learning and, and, and dozing and going in and out of sleep. With, you know, wasting the rest of the day. There's no messia in in losing the entire day of shul. It's just for the sake of the night. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. But by Hasina, I think we can all agree it's a different type of experience. Way different. So that's why some of Forshima forces, I think the Rizal says, that some of Forshima you know, forces say, but Kavana they slept in. But Kavana. They didn't purposely, they didn't like, like not wake up in time because they were sleeping and too tired and they forgot about what was going to happen the next day. But until that point in time, nobody had ever experienced the Kosh on a conscious level, except for maybe, maybe perhaps Moshe Rabbeinu. Avraham had always the booze while he was sleeping. Yitzchak and Yaakov. All the Nebuz always came to prophets for the most part while they were asleep. So they thought they're both of a major Nebuah is going to happen through sleep. They had no idea it was going to happen while they're consciously awake. Everybody. On, on whatever level they're holding on. So that's a very valid shot, by the way. It's very valid. It makes a lot of sense. And in fact, it's the only real sensible explanation for, this, for the event that I can even I can entertain and think about because there's no way I can accept that three million people slept the entire time. And missed missed the boat on that thing, on the on the next the event the next day. So then, so then, what's the point? So why, you know, why, why do we make that kind of a statement against a question that begs a question begs a question? There's different levels of sleeping. Right? There's, everyone knows that. Like sleep is just a, in a sense, it's a metaphor for lack of consciousness. You know, we have different levels of, of, of consciousness. A person can sleepwalk. A person can talk when they sleep too. Right? The difference between sleep and and not being asleep. It's the conscious mind and the unconscious mind are not connected. Usually what happens when you're sleeping, the conscious mind is like focused on yourself. For example, you could be sitting here watching a whole situation take place ahead of you and focus on a whole different event someplace else, and it's, it's transpiring right before your very eyes and not even cognizant what that's actually happening. Because you're, you're totally separate. The conscious mind and the unconscious mind are separate. They're, you know, they're kind of pushed apart temporarily. It results in a sleep-like state. That's what daydream. Is all, that's why it's called daydreaming, because even though you're conscious, there's an aspect of dreaming involved. And sometimes it gets to a point where you can actually start to have dreams while your eyes are still open. You can actually see yourself having the dream. Dreaming, the fact that you, you physically close your eyes at night time is because your body requires, your eyes require a certain amount of rest, and your brain requires a certain amount of recuperation. But most scientists, I believe, state that the brain itself only requires one hour of sleep to refresh itself. So why do we need so many hours of sleep in the end? So they hypothesize because it takes that much time to go into different you know, dream states so you can dream. And the reason why you have to dream, they hypothesize, is because otherwise your brain could never deal with all the information overload from the day it's released somehow, and most of this thing makes sense to the brain. That's what dream is for, for that. But if, if you understand life, and everything makes sense to you, like a, like a god or someone who's really in touch with the, the master part of my separations, you can get away with three hours of sleep a night, and it never affects you. Yeah. Because for you, you don't require the sleep. So sleep is not simply a reality where you go to bed and you don't wake up the next morning, you know, or, or you sleep in. Rather, the conscious experience of Harsinai, they had not yet fully achieved what they were supposed to achieve, and there's a problem with that. There's a very important problem that ties back to Ishu Kishicha Balevich had all idea. Because what does objectivity actually mean in the end? Now, have you ever found yourself, you know, someone says, you know, are you being objective? You say, of course I'm being objective. And you, can, you know you're not really being fully objective. So where's that coming from? There's times when you'd like to be objective. Someone, you know, someone angers you. And you can see yourself being angry. And you, you hear yourself saying things you shouldn't be saying. You know that. You can, well, who's hearing that? So, you know, just tell yourself, so don't say it. No, oh, I gotta say it though. Why? What, what's going on? How can you be cajoled into the saying and doing things that you consciously see you don't want to do in the end? Because the unconscious gets in there. So from below the surface, takes over to a certain amount, the conscious mind becomes like a spectator. Likewise, when a person is you know, sitting there you know, bored or whatever they go through in life, it's very possible for the levels of, of, of mind to split. The result is you're not fully there. You know, when I, when I, was, I was young, a young boy, 65 years ago, so I, you know, I was sitting in class and I was daydreaming you know, because I was bored like everybody else. 
and all of a sudden somebody else was misbehaving, not too far from me. The teacher came across. In those days, you could actually put a hand on a student and not get sued for it. And teachers did things like that. He was a good teacher, but he was also a little bit rough. And he grabbed this person, and it so shocked me. This whole thing so shocked me that I could not drift off, no matter how hard I tried, the rest of the class. I was 125% there. In that moment, whatever happened, it just so pulled everything together. The best educators do that because the more you are there, the more you're part of the experience, the more it becomes part of who you are. And that's what Kabbalah Sattar really means. There's two levels of learning. There's a level of learning where you learn it intellectually in the outside, you park it up certain in your mind, maybe you live by it, but it hasn't changed you. Knowledge has to change a person. Rabbi Shem Bar Yechai, when he gave over the Zohar, he wasn't simply giving over secrets. He was taking us from the level of Pshat, to Remez, to Drush, to Sot. On that level, as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, it corresponds to levels of soul. Nefesh, Ruch, Neshama, and Chaya. The deeper you go, the more you go past the superficiality, the, the levels, the very, you know, the very you know, uh, you know, superficial levels, you go deeper and understand it more, the more it becomes part of you. Kabbalah's Torah did not simply mean saying, yes, I, I accept. Will you take this Torah? Yes. And you see it, anyhow, after, what does it say? Well, we kind of like drain a bit over here. We'll take, what, you, know, what, you know, how much does it cost? Free, we'll take two, mm-hmm. right? You know, we, they, Horish Pet, I didn't, we said yes, we didn't know there was a second part to this whole thing, and all the details, you know. Um, so God says, see this mountain? He holds it over our head, but you were even the couple. So Chazal asked the question. If Klai Yisrael was a couple Torah, Torah, you know, Torah, Shabbat, Peh, I mean, uh, Torah itself, by saying Nasa Venishma, so what do you need to hark a gigas over their head? So, okay, more questions, more questions. All kinds of afforsions. The Gemara says, because they were makabal, they said Nasa Venishma, the Torah Shabbat, because that's the easy part, right? That's the entertaining part you could read, and even the Yikra is like complicated, but it's not all the details. But Torah Shabbat, they said out of Yirah. But by Achishverosh's time, when of course Boruch did the names by Mordechai and Haman and Esther, that's when they find the Makabal Torah Be'ahava. So what's the difference? What do you care? Year Ahava. It's, okay, it's nice your Bible. What's the difference? Because year works very much the same way, especially in our, for us as well. But Ahava is the ultimate. Ever you know, if you remember when you first went to Shaduchi, right? If there's anything you've ever loved in life, you love experience. You really love it. You know, for example. I don't know if I should use this example. But in New York, I had the best bagel lunch and cream cheese I've ever had. <laughs> and I was fully there. I mean, I, I, it was noticeably good. It sounds very much, so I thought to myself, wow, I can do that for bagel lunch and cream cheese? And I went to my Gomorrah. And I went to my Gomorrah. How much am I, what's, what's, up, what's my, my their percentage? There should be a little thermometer in our arms and I carry around. What's your, you know, your being their percentage. I'm going to have that for Gomorrah, but how much was I there? It astounds me how quickly I forget things. How quickly I can learn a Duff of Gamora, you know, and I can see something, go to a shear, and 15 minutes later, if not less, forget the point. I know it's like that, it's touching me. What happened? How do you forget it so quickly? How do you forget? But there are experiences in your life you'll never forget. You can draw on them at a moment's notice. A roller coaster ride, something that pulled body and soul together. Kabbalah Satorah means not simply saying yes. That's important. That's a starting point. Kabbalah Satorah means absorbing it into your very being. You're a different person because of it. The same, for example, you know, you're, you're walking downtown and you're, you know, you're drifting off and not focusing, not concentrating. You walk across the road and you almost get hit by a car. This close. And you'll never forget the rest of your life. In a moment, the rest of your life, you can see it like it was just yesterday. Even today sometimes. Because you're fully there. The shock, the experience, it brought you in. Atach chanei dam das, the Kishboch give a person das. Deya bina vahaska. What's the point? Why all three levels? Why pshat, remez, drush, and sod? Why all these levels? Why not just one? Why the shitting pun of the Torah? Why all these different levels? Because Torah is a journey. And the journey takes you further into yourself. The deeper you go to Torah, the deeper you go into yourself. Kabbalah's Torah means that tonight I'm not simply going to learn Torah as I've been learning Torah day after day after day and Chazri my Gemara as I've been doing day after day after day. Tonight's day I take a little reading. How much have I absorbed? How much am I prepared to absorb? 
How much am I allowed, prepared to allow Torah to impact me and change my being? That's Kabbalah of Torah. And you can't do that tonight. And you can't do this tomorrow night. You can try, and you might be able to succeed to some degree, but not like Anshus. Manish to Nahalaya Zeh, because both on that night put into the world an energy to change, an energy to absorb Torah that you cannot do the rest of the year. Every year, on Shavuos night, the way it was supposed to happen. So before she asked the question, why did Moshe Benu bring down the Luchas in the first place if he knew he was going to break them? A person does Hagbah, and he gets a little shaky. The first thing we do is we run to catch that Sefer Torah. Do not let it hit the ground. Aside from reasons of fasting, right? But don't, it, this is the Torah. It's cloth. It was prepared by man. It's ksav. It was written by man. The luchos were carved out by a Kodesh Baruch Hu and written on by a Kodesh Baruch Hu. The, the, the amount of Kedusha in the luchos were so amazing that the Chachamim and Yeshua, they fought with Moshe, the Gemara said. They fought with him. They, the mentors, they didn't want him to drop it. They said, don't do it, don't do it. He prevailed. They tried to stop it. How could you possibly drop Kodesh Baruch Hu? So he didn't really drop it. The, the Osses went back to Shemar and became heaven. What other explanation you want to have? Right? But the bottom is he brought him down and he set up a situation resulted in them hitting the ground and breaking. Why? What was the point? So Prisadik like explains. Because Moshe knew that seeing the Luchas, just seeing them, taking one look at those Luchas, he stood there for one second and said, see these? You're not going to get them. Not now. But see them anyhow? But to completely you know, you know, get them angry, get them all riled up because look what you lost? No. Because it says, the Rosha, the impression that was left on the hearts of Klai Yisrael by seeing the Luchas alone, not even receiving them, but that to see them is what keeps us Jewish until this very day. Because that's the Koyach of Shavuos. Shavuos is the Luchas coming down the mountain and able to make an impression on a person's heart to change the way you live. Don't just say yes. Let it come in. Be open, an open book. And that's why the late Tobas, it's all about, you know, the other late Tobas at this point in time. Kishach HaBalevachad. Kishach HaBalevachad means I've emptied my heart out of all superficial desires. I've emptied my heart out of all subjective perspectives. I'm an open book, right? I'm a, I'm a clean CD, so to speak, right away. Just go ahead, Kish Bochum, write. I'm yours. I'm your pad, right? With a pen, right? Just write. I, I'm here to be inscribed by you. I'm free of all other extraneous, extraneous things that block it. Because the more personal things I have in my heart, the less room there is in my heart which Bork wants to put into it. And that's Kabbalah Satara. Which we zeichet to get to such a level like that. Because Hashem, after Shuas, shall all come back different people for the better.